My guest today is Brent Steinman. Brent, how you doing? I'm doing good, David. How are you? Good. Hold your microphone up there. Yep. I'm sorry. I'll, <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm glad, uh, welcome back to the show. It's been Thank a while. you. It's been a long while. Yeah. We've uh, both been busy. What have you been doing? Uh, traveling the world, meeting interesting, exciting people. That sounds like a great job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, working with cloud. You know how it is. You My head's up cloud. there all the time. You were the first guy I ever met, I think, that was working. You and Brian Prince, I think, were the first two mm-hmm. that were working with cloud. And here it yep. is like 10 years later, and it's still going strong. Yep. I still remember when you did your first Azure presentation. Uh, I was, I'm was. i better at it now. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you keynoted that conference. Yep. That was a long time ago, yeah. too. Um, so, so, uh, so what's going on with Azure today? What do you, what excites you? Uh, the, the thing I'm really investing in a lot these days is this whole serverless movement that everybody mm-hmm. talks yeah. about. Um, it seems like there's still a lot of confusion about where it fits in the scheme of things. I spend a lot of time on conversations that are going, how should I host my application? Okay. Well, let's start with the definition. So when I say serverless, what am I talking about? So serverless, to, to keep it simple, is a managed environment where you simply give me a chunk of code and say, run it. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about as much about the plumbing for how do I get to the code. You don't have to worry about how the code is activated. Hmm. You get a sandbox that your code is triggered by a series of different actions. It, we execute the code and we return the result back. Okay, but somebody is worried about that, right? Yep. So somebody saying, yeah, what is that? So in the Azure space, that would be the, the team that's responsible for those sandboxes. So you okay. give us the code, you publish it, we take it and create a sandbox for that code. We wire up the triggers that would cause that code to get executed. Okay. And every time the trigger fires, we are the ones that are responsible for making sure it gets executed. But you no longer have to worry about all that plumbing anymore. Okay. And another definition, trigger is what? A uh, trigger is any event that would start the code running. Such as? Uh, it could be an HTTP request. Mm-hmm. It could be a file landing in a storage system. It could be a message being placed on a queue. Okay. Or it could be something that you tell us you want it to run all the time. Yeah. And one of the key advantages for it, because we manage that sandbox, your pricing options are pretty flexible. Hmm. You can go everywhere from, I want a dedicated environment that's up 24 by 7 running just my code. All right. That sounds more expensive. Yep. Or you could say, you know, this code's going to get executed infrequently. So how about you just charge me every time it runs? Okay. For the amount of time it runs. Oh, okay. You can choose up front which pricing model you want. Yep. All right. All right, uh, and that's uh, what you just described sounds a lot like Azure Functions, which is one type of... It's one of the serverless, serverless technologies options. that are act- actually out there, yeah. All right, what, what else is going on? What are the other options that I have? Um, so you can almost think of serverless as it's moving down the stack. So if we look mm-hmm. at what's available in Azure, most people, when they start running applications, usually run it on a, a server of some kind. All right, and with the cloud, we started running that code on virtualized machines. Originally, yeah. Yep. Well, actually, it's still, it's still happening. Yep, still happens we a lot. We just may or may not think about it. Yep. And then when you move to the virtual machine, you kind of gave up some control over the hardware, mm-hmm. but you still have control over the operating system, over how your code's being installed and how it's run within the machine, mm-hmm. which means you're also responsible for wiring all that up. So then people started going, well, this platform is a service or pass thing. That's where you have an environment where somebody else is managing those virtual machines and you're just saying, I need this kind of an environment to run my code in. And you move up the stack, you lose some control so you may not be able to access the operating system anymore, but you still have a fair degree of control over, this is my application, here are the files, I want to be able to access those files independently and do a few things with them. So the security box gets a little more restrictive, but there's less that you're responsible for maintaining. Serverless kind of takes that to yet another step and says, now within that sandbox, you're not going to be able to access nearly anything, but your responsibilities have gone way down because you're not even required to wire up the plumbing for the triggers that would start that code running. Mm. You give us these nice little code snippets, and they can be anywhere from one to a thousand lines of code. That would be a long snippet, a thousand lines. Yep. <laughs> but we can just take off and run with it. Okay. And then if you're, especially if you're in a microservices world, you can almost think of a serverless platform as just being another form of process orchestration. Hmm, okay. So when we say process orchestration, you're talking about having lots of small components, not necessarily thousands of lines of code, maybe, maybe a, a few dozen lines of code that do one very specific task and then put them together sort of like Lego bricks. Kind of, that's the microservices model. Right. Yep. And a lot of folks will confuse 
orchestrations with architectural patterns. Okay. So in the world today, things get even more complicated when you bring in containerization and you have things like Kubernetes. Mm. Kubernetes is a container-based orchestrator. And if you think way, way back in the day, um, you ran a web application, it had something that was responsible for activating your program when an HTTP request came in. Yeah, the, the old server. IIS. Yeah, the web you server. Know. Yep. The, the web server could be thought of as an orchestrator. Its job was to connect requests coming in to okay. applications that needed to respond to those requests, right? Right. All right. Um, Kubernetes kind of does the same thing. It's responsible for making sure the containers are running, that you can talk between the containers. It helps with some of that plumbing. So let's, let's define containers as well. So containers uh, got their start in the Linux subsystem. Uh, it was a feature that allowed you to basically run within an operating system a security light sandbox that you could have code in that was based on images. So you could create a base image for a container and then run that without all the overhead of running the entire operating system. You were just running a thin layer on top of an operating system okay. that had your application in it. Hmm. All right. Okay. So if Kubernetes is an orchestrator for containers and IIS was kind of an orchestrator for your applications, you see other orchestrators come in like Azure Service Fabric, which is a process level orchestrator. Now all of these enable these microservice architectures, which are a way to compose your application by making it up all these little pieces, leaving the orchestrators to start putting them together and stitching them together. Platform as a service, serverless are all just different types of orchestrators that give you different controls and different ways to interact with them. Okay. So are the containers inside of uh, Kubernetes are being managed, they're managed by Kubernetes? Is that an example of a serverless system? That gets into the, the almost religious war about what is and isn't serverless. Well, that's what, I that's what I'm to, trying to get yeah. at. Is what, uh, the, again, uh, we, we throw out these terms, and I just yeah. want to make sure we my, at least get your definition yeah, of there. My personal opinion is anytime you have a OS image or you're touching an OS image in some way, okay. it's still to a certain degree server. Mm. It's not serverless because you care about the operating environment. Mm. What tends to make serverless a little more unique is that you've you've given up caring about what the underlying operating system is. You just say, "Here's my code, go run it." Okay, so that's a good one. It's 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 all about uh, what does the person that's deploying the code have to know about the operating system and have yep. to manage the operating system. They may know, may realize it's there and they may touch it, but it may be. Um, not a headache for them, you know, right, as right. it is if I'm you know, building my own virtual machine yeah. and, and patching and, it and so on. Yeah, and that's where the control comes in, because if you're in a situation where, and we've all done this, I have an application that has to have certain things installed on the server for the application to run. Mm -hmm. A serverless solution is probably not going to be the right way to run that code, because it is so tightly bound to the, its operating system or its operating environment. Oh, that's interesting. I want to talk about this, because uh, uh, serverless is sort of a buzzword. Yeah. And once everything gets, once that gets popular, then the marketing people, they hijack it and they like start pushing. <laughs> got to go serverless you got to go microservices because mm -hmm. that's the cool thing to do but that's that's not true there's criteria around that yes not not everything should automatically we never put in a mandate saying we've got to do this serverless because uh -huh, i read it in that magazine on yeah. the airplane <laughs> yep. you, you want to pick something that most folks start out with small things um maybe you're so we're here at a data hack yeah. which is an awesome event it is and maybe you've got something in a data pipeline where you have to have code you want to execute but you don't want to just put a simple little Python script inside of your data workflow. So maybe you say, I'm going to create a serverless application that hosts that Python script. Okay. And then I can then call that or execute that as part of my data pipeline. It's a mm. great little area where I say, you know, this may be 20, 30 lines of Python. It's a little more than I want to manage inside my pipeline, but I need to be able to run it somewhere. Mm -hmm. It may make perfect sense to do that as a serverless application. Yeah, or you may want to call it from multiple pipelines or multiple applications. Yep. Uh, so in that instance, uh, you, you said that, and in my head I'm thinking, put that in an Azure function. Yep. Which supports Python, which is always surprising. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But th that's actually a great example of using that. A lot of people will start with that. They'll just build little tiny things, mm -hmm. things to extend larger applications okay, or larger so they solutions. Don't have to build an entire microservices architecture to take advantage Correct. of the serverless platform. Yep. Yep. But the nice thing is, is a lot of the serverless platforms add that capability. So as you grow, maybe you want to build a REST-based API that's composed of dozens of different functions, but has a seamless interface. Okay. So it allows you to have that kind of capability there. All right. Uh, is there anything else we haven't talked about that we should have? No, I think that pretty well covers it. All right. Uh, Brent, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, David. <laughs>
So the most magical thing about technology is when it brings friends together. 